Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale radio controlled Armortech British Firefly Sherman tank. Since the last video update, a lot of progress has been made to the tank's front as well as the top deck and even the turret. The tank in this video here is beginning to resemble and look like a Sherman tank compared to its earlier project updates. We'll be going over all of these additions and modifications that went into the tank to get up to this point here in this video. To start with the front hull assembly needs to first have my attention drawn to the bow hatch wells. Being an early pattern Sherman, the, fi the five Firefly has the smaller style hatches which are mounted on large blisters. The blisters that we see here are the kit originals in this format. They are squared off in appearance are each comprised of a solid chunk of CNC aluminum with all of the milling already done to the piece. If we notice the hatch hinge is also integral. The kit does supply you with two CNC basic hatches however for this model here just like with my A4 the kit hatches are not going to be utilized in place resin hatches will be found in place. In addition to removing of the kit hatches th some hand fitting is required in order to get the hatch wells to fit properly on the front glasses plate of the kit. Material will be sanded away on the belt sander in this location here until the pieces finally lock on. Now in addition to removing the material in the front the entire component will also be rounded as well as the squared off nature of the part here is a little too squared off for the that of representing of a Sherman of this pattern. As on the real Sherman tank, the entire front hatchwell area was a piece of cast steel. While performing the hand fitting to the bow hatchwells, it is a good idea to periodically stop and to test if the pieces are fitting properly. Gives you a gauge on exactly how much material, if any, needs to still be removed. Here I just came back in from belt sanding the parts outdoors, which is why I have my winter gloves on. And you can see that the pieces have been buffed away. I'll now align it in the hatch well. And as you can see, the piece is a perfect fit. Now it wasn't a whole lot of material. It was actually done very quickly and very effortlessly with that of a belt sander. In comparison, here we have a stock unit. And as you can see, some material needs to be removed. After the other hatch well is at the same specs as this one, I will then go ahead and start with the reshaping progress of the part until it is at the condition of which then I feel it's fit for installation. Another portion on the build that needed to be fabricated was that of the bow front fenders. The front fenders did originally come with the Armortech kit. They look like this unit here. They're comprised out of two pieces. You have the fender panel and then there is a back portion that seals off the side of the fender. The fender then gets bolted to the bottom sponson of the tank. Rather than utilizing the stock kit component, I went ahead and fabricated a new set of front fenders. The front fenders that you see here are also the same type listed on the EastCoastArmory.com product line. They are and are the type that are found on my other builds both on this channel as well as on the ECA webpage itself. The fenders are comprised out of sheet steel. They are cut, shaped, bent, and have their crimp line all added to the fender. As you see the crimp line is an actual real crimp line that is pressed into the steel. In addition to the top part of the fender it also has the side portion along with the rigidity brace which is found on all Sherman tank front fenders. As you can see it's all steel construction and is all soldered together. The components in this scene now are ready for their prime and then once they are primed they will be fitted to the vehicle. Now, another bit of detailing that differs the ECA version from the kit one is that on the kit one I mentioned before that there are two fasteners which mount the fender to the bottom of the sponson. This is incorrect for a real Sherman tank and was modified in order for it to be more accurate on this build. For a Sherman, the fenders mount to a strip of metal which emerges from the bottom 
portion of the armor plate. That portion is welded to the front plate and then this fender here gets bolted via three fasteners to the strip plate. The strip plate was added to the sponson in a much earlier portion of the build and that is mentioned in a very early video update. These guys here are now going into their prime and they're going on to their next step. Moving our way to the top deck, here we have the top deck before the actual installation. Just like on all Armortech tanks, the top deck is made out of a panel of aluminum in this case. And for the turret ring, it utilizes the standard Armortech brass bushing. Like I often mention in these Armortech videos, the brass bushing that is used for mounting onto the turret is very nicely done, is a very nice feature. It really helps with the performance of the turret rotation as opposed to a lot of other manufacturers which don't have any type of bearing surface. As for the bearing itself, it is one complete solid brass unit. It is not segmented or, and it is not comprised out of any other components. It's all CNC'd and the tolerances are very nicely done. To mount it to the tank, I will use my usual format and that is the use of fasteners which will be drilled around the circumference of the ring. The fasteners will be countersunk so that they do not impede with the rotation of the turret. In addition to adding the fasteners, another modification that I generally do to these rings is that the portion of where the ring meets the turret rotational gear, I usually cut and remove a small little notch, removing the some of the material. This also helps with the installation of the gear in the motor and, per, and prevents any sort of interaction where the two pieces may touch and hit each other. And here's the top deck now, ready for its coat of primer and then installation to the tank. As you can see, since the last scene, I went ahead and heavily modified the brass ring with the mods that I mentioned earlier. This would include the mounting fastener holes, which as you can see are countersunk, as well as the removal of the material for clearance of the tart rotation gear. In addition to that, you can see I also put two little notches on the front portion here of the ring. The reason for that is because the way the top pan is designed, you have two fasteners on either end here and these sets of fasteners is what mount the top deck to the bow hatch wells which are mounted onto the tank currently. Because I went ahead and pre-mounted them to the tank first, the top deck will be mounted on with the ring already pre-installed. As you can see, if I went ahead and mounted the ring to the top deck and then mounted to the tank, the brass ring would be in the way of the fasteners. So with a Dremel, I went ahead and cut a small little notch into each of these locations here for the clearance of the fasteners. Now it's important to note that once the tart gets mounted on, these small little mods here will have no effect on the actual rotation of the tart, nor will they inhibit in any way the performance and smoothness of the tart rotating. As for other mods that the top deck got, you can see here, I went ahead and drilled two small countersunk fastener locations. The purpose of these is that when the top front and the top rear deck get mounted to the hull, the two panels are not connected to each other in any way. Like I did on the M4A4, I went ahead and mounted small little strips in these two locations here, which bridge the gap and secure both halves of the top deck to each other, thus making for a more secure and one piece upper deck as opposed to having the pieces left in their separate form. Another thing you can see is that right before I go ahead and paint it, I went ahead with a palm sander and buffed down the metal plate in both the interior and the exterior, of course, for making the paint help stick better. Moving our way to the rear engine deck, the engine deck that you see here is the kit original with some mods that were made. Starting with the deck itself, the Armortech Sherman deck is comprised out of a one piece bent piece of aluminum plate. On it has laser cut portions for the grill work and the rear engine hatch. One bit of detailing that I made that was absent on the Armortech kit was that of the 
seam and panel lines which are present on these top decks. On the real Sherman tank, these two panels here would be welded to the sides of the hull and the entire rear deck here were actually bolted onto the tank and each one of these were comprised of the panels. In total there were three panels excluding the engine hatch which were used on the back of the M4A4. As for the slit lines, these were etched in with that of a Dremel. The lines were marked with a pencil and carefully etched with a steady hand. By etching the lines really helps the look of the engine deck and enhances it greatly from the kit original version. Another modification I had to make was that of with the rear engine hatch itself. The ArmorTech rear engine hatch is slightly too short in dimensions. On the ArmorTech kit, there are two extra panels of aluminum which run along these two portions here. And the engine hatch, which I have here, would have fit in this location. On the real M4A4, these two slits were not present. The slits themselves would be found on other vehicles, namely that of an M4A3. On the M4A4, the engine deck was larger and went from side to side. To go ahead and fabricate that, I went ahead and deleted the two sections, which I just mentioned, and a brand new rear engine hatch was fabricated. For the hatch itself, it was fabricated of plate aluminum, which was the exact same thickness of the kit original, thus making it a drop-in install. As for the hatch itself, the ArmorTech hinges were still retained, and the other detailings which were found on the engine hatch were added as well, that being the three mounting fasteners and the two grab handles. On the real Sherman tank, these three bolts is what bolts onto an inner lip, which is found in this portion here, and keeps the deck firmly in place. However, for this radio control model, that's less than ideal, and so the fasteners that you see here are purely for show and serve no other function. The reason for this is that since this is a radio control tank and you do need to get access to the components underneath, rather than messing around with a wrench trying to remove all these fasteners, which can cause problems and scratch paint, simply just leave them for detail and just grab the hinge or the handle once everything's all hinged together and just lift it up. This is the exact same design that I utilized on the M4A4 build. Another mod that I made was that of the small little mounting holes that we have here. Just like what I mentioned on the top deck, there's going to be a strip of brass which we bolted connecting the two upper halves together. The countersunk was added to this portion as well and once everything gets added, the fasteners and the bodywork will be added to delete these components. As you can see, there are some bodywork that was made to the side. This was to delete any of the present holes that were added by ArmorTech in order to fit on their tools. Since I'll be utilizing my own tools and tool mounts, the stock holes were not utilized and so were simply deleted in this portion here. The entire rear deck in this configuration here is now ready to receive its coat of primer and then its interior coat of flat white for the rear deck and a dark olive drab for the hatch itself. Moving on to the tank's turret rotation, to complete the top deck of the vehicle, the turret rotation system needs to be installed as well. For the system, I will be utilizing the kit original unit, and that's comprised of the components you see here, sands the fasteners, which are also supplied with the kit. We have here the pre-wired geared motor, a CNC aluminum motor mount, and a CNC steel gear. All three of these components will be built out of box and used for this model. Like I've mentioned in my other ArmorTech builds, the kit supplied turret rotation units are quite well and perform very smooth. And here's the top deck now ready for installation. As you can see since the last scene, the ring has been permanently mounted to the top deck with that of the countersunk fasteners. The entire top deck has been primed as well as the interior portion has been painted to match the rest of the model. And we can see here that the turret rotation gear has also been mounted. For the turret rotation system, I went ahead and added a small little shim in order to have the just the amount of clearance required to have the motor clear the top deck. As for the amount of clearance, 
here I have a scrap piece of paper. And as you can see, paper slides right in, giving me more than enough clearance for the gear to the top deck. Because of the shim, the stock fasteners had to be replaced as they were not long enough in order to add the shim. With the new fasteners added, as you can see, there's a lot more meat on the fastener to grab onto the component. In addition to the fastener, a crimp washer was added to both of the components. This along with red Loctite was utilized in order to mount the component to the top deck. Of all of the parts on the tank that are very important to lock down nice and firmly, this is one of them. As this component here will be under a lot of stress in order to turn and, and be able to rotate the turret. To overcome the mass of the turret, this piece here cannot move, not even a little bit. If there is any sort of play in this component here, that is completely unacceptable and the turret performance will suffer from that greatly. And here's the tank's interior with the last of the components required prior to the installation of the top deck. Let's go ahead and take a closer look to see what was added in order to get it up to this part here. The one bit of equipment that was added to finish off the interior was that of the tank's remote lighting. Like most of my armor type builds, this tank here will have a remote lighting feature in which you could turn on and turn off the lights via the radio. The remote lighting is powered by that of a servo and an impact switch. It feeds off of the tank's main power supply, so no extra batteries are required in order to power on the lights, which does save a lot on the electrical as well as on the interior space as you don't need an extra battery floating around just to power the lights. The, this component here controls both the front and the rear lights. Currently set up on this model, only the front lights are hooked up at this point as the rear lights will be added after the top deck is installed. However, the installation of the rear lights is that of a screw type junction box, similar to like the one I have here. To actually power the lights, rather than using bulbs, I went ahead and utilized LEDs. The LEDs are fitted inside of the rest and housing of the headlights. These are the exact same headlight housings that you see on all of my 1.6 scale American and USAFV from both static as well as even RC. The resin component was it is already hollow and has a clear resin bulb which will be added after the tank is painted. The LED themselves were modified to have them fit in the smaller recess. The LEDs were turned down on the lathe as well as having other tips and tricks done to them to compress the size in order to have them fit into the resin housing without any problems with that of the fit. Like I said before, the headlights are my resin versions which also not only include the lens but also the blackout light is another component that will light up. On this set here, they are actually made of clear resin. Now, before the pieces were installed and before the bulbs were fitted, as you notice, everything is painted with that of a silver spray paint. In addition to the silver spray paint, the entire component, sans the actual face of the lens itself, was pre-painted with that of flat black spray paint. With the flat black and the silver spray paint that was added, do give a lot more of an insulation from the bright light, which will prevent the resin from actually glowing. This is something that is a concern with some headlights out there on some models, is that due to the polymer nature of the either resin or plastic, if you have a nice bright bulb, the plastic itself will glow due to the light. However, by adding the layers of paint, really do cut down the bulb glow to a minimum. And on my other builds, there is absolutely no glowing of the plastic parts that are present. Now, because the blackout light is clear and is actually hollowed out in a channel, when the light turns on, the blackout light will also activate as well via passive light transfer. To test the system, I'll show you right now. To test the system, I will first turn on the radio. And now I'll turn on the tank. Currently the sound system is on, however, 
However, the sound system is not needed at all to turn on the lights. So I'll deactivate the sound system. The lights are controlled with this button here currently on the radio. And now that's triggered, you see the, the lights in action. As you see, the LEDs are nice and bright, which will definitely is important in that it has to power through the clear resin lens, which will be added again after the tank progresses further. A similar technique will be applied to the tail lights, but that's going to be further in an upcoming video update. From this angle here, I'll turn the light back on and put my hand over the area to show that there's no glow coming from the resin itself. Now, like I said before, light will transfer through into the blackout light. However, currently there's a little bit of tape covering the lens of the blackout light in order to protect it from the layers of paint to come from both the protective layers as well as the primer and base coat which will follow as the build progresses. The same exact procedure is done on all of my radio control tanks and even the static tanks that I build that feature a lighting system. Moving our way to the back of the lighting system takes us to the control panel. One other addition that was added to con the control panel was that of the light kill switch. In addition to the impact switch for the actual light system itself, the model has a light kill switch in case you want to run the model without the lights being turned on, which is good in case you accidentally hit the switch on the radio. With this master kill switch here, you simply hit the switch, and no matter how many times the servo actuates the function button, the lights will not turn on. As for the rear tail lights, they will be connected to this box over here, which being in the back will cut down on a lot of the extra wiring, which would have been required in order to run them all the way to the front portion that you see here. Moving our way to the batteries, an addition that was made to the batteries was that of the terminal cover caps that you see here. These polymer cover caps insulate the terminals and is a great asset as it protects the model from any type of accidental discharge which can possibly happen during the tank's construction. Since a lot of the parts on the tank are metal, it is very easy to accidentally bridge and make contact with the pieces that can have detrimental results from either shorting out the batteries or even some of the expensive electronics in this tank. Caps themselves are a simple drop and install and that with them out of the way, both greatly reduce the risk of any type of short circuits as well as give a lot more aesthetics to the interior. In addition to the interior, a lot of progress is starting to be made to the front exterior portion of the build as well. As you can see, since the seen the front mud flaps that were mentioned earlier have been mounted to the tank. Now as a quick note, the fasteners that you see here are mounted with the head of the fastener on the bottom and the fastener nut on top. This is a mirror image on the opposite side. The way you see it here is accurate for that of Sherman tanks. All Sherman tanks feature their front mud flaps mounted to the tank in this manner. The reason for this actually makes sense as with the threads of the fasteners protruding outward leaves for a flusher bottom portion of the vehicle. With the flusher bottom portion, it's less of a chance of some foreign material to get snagged and cause damage to the front fenders. Now one thing as of note is that on the real Sherman tank, the front fender is connected with several fasteners. You have the three main fasteners on the top, and then there are two smaller fasteners on the inside portion that sandwich the fender to that of the final drive. That was not done on this model, sp for specifically for certain reasons. First, the fasteners on the final drive are held down with red Loctite during the installation, and I didn't want to go ahead and remove them just for the, again, mounting on of the mud flap. Another more important reason is that due to the tank being radio controlled, this area here is at high risk of four material getting caught up by the tracks and being pulled through. If that's the case, something needs to bend and give out of the way. If I went ahead and hard mounted the fender to the actual final drive, the sheet metal fender would not survive and would cause and suffer from damage, which is actually very true to the real one as well. 
So rather than mounting it on, the piece is held on via spring pressure from the mounting strip, which these three fasteners are mounted to. If anything is to come and hit the fender, the fender will flex out of the way to a certain degree and which will protect the sheet metal from occurring any type of damage or bending, which can hurt the look and require some bodywork as well as even some of a repaint. With this little spring feature here, it does alleviate a lot of these issues. In addition to the interior, a lot of progress is starting to be made to the front exterior portion of the build as well. As you can see, since the scene, the front mud flaps that were mentioned earlier have been mounted to the tank. Now as a quick note, the fasteners that you see here are mounted with the head of the fastener on the bottom and the fastener nut on top. This is a mirror image on the opposite side. The way you see it here is accurate for that of Sherman tanks. All Sherman tanks feature their front mud flaps mounted to the tank in this manner. The reason for this actually makes sense as with the threads of the fasteners protruding outward leaves for a flusher bottom portion of the vehicle. With the flusher bottom portions, less of a chance of some foreign material to get snagged and cause damage to the front fenders. Now, one thing as of note is that on the real Sherman tank, the front fender is connected with several fasteners. You have the three main fasteners on the top, and then there are two smaller fasteners on the inside portion that sandwich the fender to that of the final drive. That was not done on this model, sp for specifically for certain reasons. First, the fasteners on the final drive were held down with red Loctite during the installation, and I didn't want to go ahead and remove them just for the, again, mounting on of the mud flap. Another more important reason is that due to the tank being radio controlled, this area here is at high risk of four material getting caught up by the tracks and being pulled through. If that's the case, something needs to bend and give out of the way. If I went ahead and hard mounted the fender to the actual final drive, the sheet metal fender would not survive and would cause and suffered from damage, which is actually very true to the real one as well. So rather than mounting it on, the piece is held on via spring pressure from the mounting strip, which these three fasteners are mounted to. If anything is to come and hit the fender, the fender will flex out of the way to a certain degree and which will protect the sheet metal from occurring any type of damage or bending, which can hurt the look and require some bodywork as well as even some of a repaint. With this little spring feature here, it does alleviate a lot of these issues. Moving towards the top of the transmission cover takes us to the bolt strip. On the real Sherman tank, the like I mentioned in a earlier project update video, the transmission on this early style Sherman is comprised out of three pieces which are bolted together via flange work. Then the component bolts directly to the front of the hull via a row of fasteners. This is true for all vehicles of the Sherman family, including even the M3 Lee. As for the Armor Tech kit, the Armor Tech kit transmission was very basic in its overall shape. And if we also recall from the other video, I went ahead and built up this portion here to give it the appearance that you see here, which is replicates that of the real one in a more realistic manner. One portion that I did not add was that of the top portion here of the bolt strip. Now, the bolt strip on the Armor Tech kit is absent of any detailing and is just a flat plate with pre drilled and tapped holes in order to mount the transmission cover to the front of the tank. To add this detailing here, this was done purely for detail purposes and serves no actual structural function. The strip itself is comprised out of a strip of sheet styrene, and the flange work is also thicker pieces of styrene which were glued together and blended in via bodywork. The flange lines were connected to each other to further seal off the illusion. The component that you see here stands off slightly from the top deck, which again further enhances the illusion that the transmission cover and the top plate are two totally separate pieces. As for the fasteners themselves, these are the actual kit fasteners and are connecting the two plates together. No mods were made to them and they were simply bolted to the plate as per the kit instructions. The fasteners went on with very little hand fitting required and then the detail faceplate was simply added in place.
And here's the model with the top deck now permanently mounted to the hull. All of the kit supply fasteners were utilized and they all went on with a little bit of hand fitting here and there, but basically it was a problem free install. Here we can see the brace that I was referring to earlier. There's a piece of brass and the two fasteners here are secured to the top deck. This was done on both sides to give the upper hull more rigidity. From here, I can go ahead now and continue with the rest of the build, but this is a huge step out of the way and the Sherman is beginning to look like a Sherman now. As for the turret turning mechanism, the mechanism was hooked up to the tank's RC equipment and the tank is currently in its on state. I will go ahead and test the turret turner motor to see how well it performs. Now, as you can see, the turret turner turns nice and smooth. Now, one little addition that I have yet to be made to this ring, if anyone's a fan of my videos, you'll know what I'm referring to, and that is a small little film of grease, which will be added to the brass bushing, as well as the turret turner gear itself. The reason why I did not add the grease at this point is that at this point here, the turret still needs to be removed on and off for some of the installation and calibration of some of the components. If you go ahead and add the grease at this stage here, it will become very messy with all the time the turret needs to be removed. So the grease will be added to the turret ring shortly after and further down the line of production. With the top deck now pretty much out of the way and ready for installation, I can now also turn my attention to the tank's turret. For the tank's turret, the Armor Tech kit supplies you with the following parts here. Not shown in this video is that of the gun components and the other Firefly components, which will be discussed in an upcoming video. The turret used on the Armor Tech Firefly is very similar. In fact, it's actually an upgraded version of the original M4A3 turret, which was released by Armor Tech back in 2005. That turret I have fully reviewed in the M4A4 video as that tank utilized, I swapped out the Armatech Firefly turret with that of the original Sherman M4A3 turret. But more info in, on that is found in the other video. As for this tank here, again, I'll be utilizing the stock turret. As for the Armatech turret, as you can see here, it is all one piece aluminum casting. All of the components have their CNC drillings done for the blower, main gun, as well as the periscope. Like I said in the other video, the pot, the turret itself resembles that of a large cast aluminum pot. It has a similar type of texture. The texturing that's found on the surface is very nicely done. In fact, it, it's one of the few areas on the tank that need absolutely no improvements whatsoever. You could simply just paint this turret as is and the cast texturing is more than adequate for the job at hand. Some improvements or I should say some additions that this turret has compared to that of the original Sherman turret is that first of the components that make it for that of a Firefly. Namely that of the addition of the side loader hatch that you see here. The Fireflies were predominantly made from early production style Shermans that only have a single hatch for the turret, and that is of the Commander's Copula. One modification that the Brits did was they went ahead and removed this portion here of the tank's turret in order to fit a small hatch for that of the loader, which is pretty much the exact same thing that the United States did with later production versions of the Sherman tank's turret. Another a change from the older version is that of these two holes in the back here. On the rear portion of the Firefly, they have a distinct radio box as well as a counterweight, which is found in the rear portion of the bustle. All those components will be discussed in an upcoming video as they are also included with the Armor Tech kit. Another slight difference compared to the first offering is that of the ejection port. The first Armor Tech Sherman, the injection port milling was not as pronounced as you see it on this one here, which is a little bit of an improvement and makes the addition of the parts a little bit easier. Outside of the external pot itself, we have the internal rings which complete the turret. 
These two components here are found on both releases of the Armatech Sherman. Starting with first the geared tooth ring, which is made out of laser cut steel. This component here is, is found on all the other Armatech tanks, namely the Tiger, Panther, only they're a little bit larger compared to the Tart ring for the Sherman. These components here are very nicely done and work very well. There is a spacer neck ring. This ring here is made out of CNC aluminum. It is one piece, nicely machined, just like many of the other parts on these kits. And again, this, these two components are direct carryovers from the 05 release. The one portion of this kit that's different compared to the older one is that of the bottom turret pan. The bottom turret pan on the first generation kits were made out of steel and they were laser cut. This version here is laser cut out of aluminum. As you see, it's much lighter. One, another difference that differentiates the two generation of turrets is that of this center portion here. As you can see, there is a bar which is integrally found into the bottom portion of the ring. This bar is utilized for that of the gun elevation and the press. This version, this kit here features a different system compared to that of the original release from 05, which used a gear system. In fact, on the A4 that I did, I had to mimic this component as the parts that I had to raise and lower the gun were for this kit and not the original kit, which the tar only the tar casting was from. Again, more information on that is in the other video. And here are all the components now with their primer and interior colors painted. From here, the turret will be assembled with the components that are supplied with the kit. And here's the turret components now fully assembled. As you can see, all of the parts from before have been fitted to the turret shell and with the use of the kit supply fasteners. The installation is very straightforward and very simple. Of course, red Loctite was utilized on all the fasteners that you see here to keep them nice and secure and to prevent them from backing out as time goes on and as the model is driven. One addition that I did make was that on the interior fasteners, I went ahead and added a washer to keep the piece on a lot more tight compared to just the standard fastener alarm. The turret can now be mounted to the top deck once installed, which will then have the turret be able to rotate. However, even without the grease, I can still mount the turret onto the tank and test the turret rotation. As you can see from the way the turret performed, it did perform nice and smooth. However, there is some sluggishness in some corners. This will be addressed with some sandpaper, removing a little bit of material from the ring, as well as possibly even from the turret neck. With this material removed, as well as the grease added to the bushing, the turret will perform a lot smoother compared to its first initial test run here. However, for first initial test run, the, the turret's performance performed pretty good. And with that, that concludes this project update video for this 1-6 scale Armatech radio controlled British Firefly. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook. And don't forget to check out EastCoastArmory.com for more 1-6 and 1-16 scale builds and detail components. Thank you.